Instead of seeing like a new wave of workers coming to this country, trying to get involved in the workforce as a new workforce to be organized, they saw people as coming to take their jobs, take their members' jobs. Our next guest is friend of the show, Kim Kelly. This is the first time, I think this is the first time that we actually have you on the radio. We've done some extra stuff like online stuff, but I think this is the first time we've actually had you on the radio with us. Oh, that's so funny. It feels like we've talked, well, we've talked so much over the past yeah. year, year and a half, but sort I of assumed. <laughs> yeah, but no, I don't think so. I think this is the first time. So, so, uh, welcome everybody to Kim Kelly. Um, thanks. <laughs> thanks for coming to the show, Kim. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You know I do anything for you boys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. So the first thing I wanted to ask you about is is not um, it's not about labor, and it's not even specifically about the book. It's about your, your writing style because – and I wanted to maybe know a little bit about, like, how you came into, to, like – if there was any anything in your education or, or any particular like way that you try to write, because I um you know I read a lot of the stuff that you put out, uh, and most of it now is labor stuff, and we can talk about we can talk about what it used to be in a little bit, but um and so I've always enjoyed it. But the other day I read something that you wrote about like a tea convention and I don't know why I clicked on it, but I read it. I don't like tea. I'm not a tea guy. Um, but, but I read it and I was like really engrossed. And I think that was the first time that I actually realized that you were, a, a, that how good of a writer you are, because I enjoyed reading this article about a thing that I could not care less about. So how did you, <laughs> like, how, how did you come to write the way that you do? Like, is there kind of a, um, you know, did you use, have you always just been a really good writer or like what's, you know, how, how did you develop your style? That's really interesting. No one's asked me that before. And I think, I think there's a few things that factor into the way I write. I mean, I learned to read when I was really young and I was really precocious, pretentious little kid. So I read really widely when I was young and I built up a pretty strong vocabulary and I always, you know, I, I didn't, Actually, actually what, maybe one reason that I write the way I do is I've never really taken any journalism classes or that many writing classes. I've never mm. had, really had anyone tell me how I'm supposed to do it. Mm. And so I just write the way that things sound in my head and sound good to me. And I think that is maybe a little bit more accessible than more structured writing styles. Mm. And also since I, uh, I guess my most significant writing experience for most of my life has been writing about a subject that is not necessarily everyone's cup of tea, writing about heavy metal for yeah most of my career. And I wrote about heavy metal and like really obscure stuff and kind of complicated concepts in that very specific world for places like Brooklyn Vegan and NPR and Stereogum, like mainstream publications. And I had to learn how to take my enthusiasm for something and my depth of knowledge about something a little bit obscure and find a way to pull people in who didn't know what I was talking about, mm -hmm. like how to grab people and how to show them like, this is something that you could totally be into too. I'm not going to hit you with a bunch of SAT words or any gatekeepery, you know, BS. I'm going to try to be clear and try to just show people why I care so much, why I think it's cool. And that's the sort of thing that I bring to my labor writing too, because it's not exactly, you know, Swedish death metal or Indonesian grindcore, but <laughs> not everyone knows a ton about labor history or labor's present unless they're actively involved, actively interested. So, and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of acronyms, a lot of labor law things, a lot of mm -hmm. shorthand that people uh, who are writing for a specifically labor audience might just assume everyone knows what we're talking about when we complain about Taft Hartley or talk about the NLRB, right. but not everyone knows that stuff and that's fine. So taking a little bit of extra time to explain things a little more clearly and break things down and just assume that whoever's reading might not know all the same stuff I do, but mm -hmm. has every reason to be interested. And yeah, I think I just get excited about the things I like. I really like the stuff <laughs> I write about and hopefully that comes through. I think I think it does because I you know I, like when I read the article about the tea convention I was like oh this is very interesting maybe I'll go to a tea convention <laughs> even though I do not enjoy tea <laughs> not even a In little fairness, bit. I spent most of that convention getting wasted because it was mixed with a bar convention. <laughs> so maybe my my willingness to be um, a little human and a little bit of a dirtbag maybe mm -hmm. that comes through too. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm definitely not um, an unapproachable kind of writer. I'd say that I'm not an right. academic and right. I'm not a, a stuffed shirt by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> right. I, well, I, I think that's uh, that's those are the kind of, you know, people that that I'm drawn to as far as their, you know, their media output and, and their writing and their, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, so the. Stuff that you did before, you you kind of alluded to it. You were a heavy metal writer. Um, talk to us ab- about that being a heavy metal writer. Um, <laughs> and, very specific and, you know, vocation. <laughs> it's a very specific vocation. And when and when we say heavy metal, we don't mean even the kind of popular scene metal right that that was oh, no, we're not talking about metallica though i did yeah. interview lars ulrich he or, was or, or even or, or even metallica or, or or um you know like asking alexandria or under oath or, oh, the, or, no. or, or some of those <laughs> folks like those are you know those are the kind of bands that i was i was briefly really into uh when i was in middle school and high school um you know and I, I asked you about some of them and you were like i have no idea who these people are and so i looked up some of the bands that you listened to and it was like totally indecipherable and you know, <laughs> <laughs> so totally oh, yeah. totally different genre caveman noise <laughs> when, <laughs> when we're talking about heavy metal so how did you get how did you get into that kind of writing about this indecipherable genre of music <laughs> It's yeah, you can you can catch a word here or there if you know what you're looking for. But <laughs> yeah, it's a very um not a very accessible type of music, whether it's and it's you know, multifaceted, whether it's black metal or death metal or grindcore or industrial, like there's a lot of different ways to, you know, to be part of the extreme metal category. But I get into it when I was pretty young because I was, you know, I grew up I think I might be a year or two older than you, but I'm 34 now. So when I was growing up like 13, 14, that's when new metal was huge. And mm-hmm. I got into those kind of bands like Slipknot, Paramount, Fight Thousand, all that stuff. But I was always drawn to the more aggressive parts of it. So it was kind of an easy jump from Slipknot to Cannibal Corpse and Morbid Angel and, you know, these really, you know, aggressive death metal bands. And something in it just spoke to me. And I'd always wanted to be a writer. I wasn't sure what kind, but I happened to be, and this is like a total lucky coincidence. I happened to be writing for my county newspaper uh, when I was 15 like just writing about like politics and sports and stuff for their teen section. And that was right the same time that I got into death metal, more extreme metal. And they let me do record reviews and do band interviews. So I was like writing about Pig Destroyer and Behemoth for like the Burlington County Times. And <laughs> I just started writing for more zines and web zines like they were then. And like little local zines and got an internship at Metal Maniacs. Like I just kind of decided I'm going to write about heavy metal. That's the thing I'm going to do. And I did it for a really long time. And I was pretty M slash was slash M pretty good at it. I got, um, I was probably the best known woman writing about metal in the U S for a pretty long time. And um, it was an interesting world to live within because I was not only writing about metal, I was throwing shows. I was touring with bands. I worked at a record label. I did promo. I kind of did a little bit of everything. And um that was my my real world education. I went to college, but I didn't I, I didn't put that much effort in. <laughs> so being out in the world and meeting all these different kinds of people, that really like kind of opened my my mind a little bit. So I'm from a really rural, isolated area. Mm-hmm. And um, by the time I was 27 or something, I started working at Vice in 2014 and 2015. We unionized. 2016, we got our first contract. Like. I ended up in the right place at the right time and got super involved in the union effort. That's when I got to meet my first labor organizers. That's when I learned more about labor law. Like that was this huge introduction to this world that I'd known about a tiny bit because my family's union, but they're not, you know, my dad's part of the union, my granddad's part of the union, because that's what you do. That's the kind of jobs they had, you know, construction, steel workers. But uh, I hadn't thought about it that much until I got a chance to join one. And then that really shifted everything I wanted to write about. Like mm. I'd written about heavy metal for like 20 years. And then I was like, okay, I think I want to make a switch and see if I can pull this off. And well, here we are. So I guess it worked out. Okay. I've, I've read some, um, 
memoir wouldn't be the right word, but but looking back on you know the time that you spent doing heavy metal stuff and and some of the things that you've talked about um, doing that kind of work, there was there was a certain amount of exploitation and sexual harassment that came with being oh, yeah. a woman reporting on heavy metal. Did any of those experiences with abuse and exploitation make you more likely? to like make you make you more likely to unionize or, or make you feel like tender ready to catch fire when you had the opportunity or do you, do you think it was it was just a little bit of every like how did how did those the negative experiences that you had writing for um re, you know reporting on heavy metal bands how did that um how did that affect you as you unionized at vice and and as you began your transition to labor reporting mm, that's interesting so it definitely had a big impact so i started going writing about metal and going to metal shows when i was still a kid like 15 mm -hmm. 16 and that was <laughs> that was brutal because i was usually one of the only young women or girls in the area a lot of older guys took a lot of liberties and it i definitely went through some pretty gnarly situations and learned a lot of lessons about who you can trust and where you're safe and where you're not safe and I also, as I got a little older and got a little bit more interested in the world outside the woods, the world outside, like my little very narrow white girl experience, I got more political and I educated mm -hmm. myself about politics. And those earlier, well, they never really went away, but the, especially those earlier experiences with sexual harassment and abuse and assault, like that made me into a feminist. And that mm -hmm. made me someone who cared a lot about like gender equality in the scene. And then as I, I read more and met more kinds of people that, you know, that worldview expanded and I started being interested in, you know, calling out and challenging other types of oppression and bigotry in the scene. And that came through in my work. And really by the time that we got involved in uh, doing union organizing advice, I was like, <laughs> I was pretty well known slash hated slash loved very extreme reactions to my work all the time because I was really, really political in a way that caused a lot of consternation and discomfort within a scene that was more than happy to not look at its its ugly parts or mm. confront its problems with every kind of bigotry you can think of. Right. And, I mean, uh, the, I, the heavy black metal, death metal scene is is very politically complicated like you'll have anywhere oh from <laughs> you know it, I, I mean it this is you know and this is a scene that i'm not terribly familiar with but my understanding is that you know it, it's a scene where you've got like anywhere from genuine actual you know swastika tattoo neo-nazis to like violent revolutionary communists all kind of in broad you know listening to the same music and at the same shows right yeah, it's well, usually the like the the further ends of the spectrum would not end up in the same room because that could get dicey. Mm -hmm. But the thing about writing about metal and being in part of that world is like, yes, there's definitely yeah, different political extremes, but most people are in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it's in that same way that metal is kind of a microcosm for the rest of the world, the rest of our society. Most people are just kind of in the middle, trying to hang on to the parts they enjoy, trying to tune out the stuff they don't like. And the people in the middle will either ignore you or get upset when you tell mm -hmm. them like, yes, I understand you like that band, but they're really anti-Semitic or like they really hurt this woman. Like, I'm sorry that something you enjoy is complicated and I'm sorry to be the person to tell you, but this is something that's important for you to know. Like when you make your decisions about who you're going to support, who you're going to go see. And I mean, that's... I mean, you, you could say that about any community in this country, right? Like any social group. Right. And um, I guess just being having that political viewpoint and then being offered an opportunity to do something material, like by unionizing, by actually improving our workplace, by actually improving the experiences of like, the most marginalized workers, like that was huge. Like that fit perfectly into the politic I was developing and into like the other activism work I was doing in New York at the time. Like it all just made sense. And I was like, well, of course this like loud mouth lefty heaven metal girl is in a union now. Like, I guess that, I guess that tracks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's, well, that's what I still am. Like I've kind of <laughs> been the same for a really long time. I just turned my laser focus to a different struggle mm -hmm. even though like i'm still covered in tattoos and you know listen to heavy metal all the time i'm still still a metalhead it's just you know i i buy different large gilded shirts with different logos on them now that i <laughs> collect union merch instead of metal merch right right 
Yeah, well, so the, um, you know, the getting into labor reporting from that, from that, uh, uh, from that kind of scene, you know, I think that probably gives you a pretty, pretty unique, tr- uh, pretty unique trail to where you are. Did that have any, anything to like? Was was your trajectory? Did that make you? Did that play into you wanting to write the book? Like, is, is your trajectory um, part of why you wanted to write Fight Like Hell? Yeah, because I mean, I feel like um, almost, if not every, every writer wants to write a book. And I always thought I would, but I always assumed my first book would be about metal. And then things shifted and it turned out that that was not the case. But I guess I've had such a mm, unorthodox sort of career that I've kind of pieced together, like with grit and good luck and the help of some really good friends that I've never really had stability And it kind of felt like if I write a book and I do a good job and it reaches people, then maybe that will kind of put me in a little bit more of a stable place. Like I can be an author. I can do bigger things than, you know, hustling, writing articles for a couple hundred bucks a pop. And I mean, I still do that. And I'm probably still going to do that forever. But it seemed like it might give me a little bit of the credibility, I guess, that even if that I have still struggled with feeling like I have. I still have like that imposter syndrome, right? Because I'm not an academic, I'm not a historian, I'm not trained, I'm self-taught. I guess my biggest strengths are my passion for this stuff and my ability to talk and emphasize and listen to workers and listen to their struggles and try to communicate that in in an approachable way. Like I'm I'm still kind of amazed that I get to do this stuff. And uh, I mean, I've been unemployed since 2019. Like I'm, I, I'm from a very rural working class family. Like I'm doing all this by the skin of my teeth. So when I got the opportunity to write a book, I thought, okay, maybe this will be something that gives me, I can take a breath mm-hmm. and then I can kind of build on that. And we'll see, it's only been out for a little bit, but just the fact that I was able to do this, like to write a book and like mm-hmm. it got published and people are reading it. That is like the pinnacle of a life dream. And now I just have to figure out what I'm going to do now. <laughs> right, right. Well, so what, you know, the book is is titled Fight Like Hell, The Untold History of American Labor. Um, you know, and so that that was part of the, you know, the, the stability and the credibility was part of the reason for, like, writing a book. But what was the motivation for writing this book? This is the book that I wanted to read. And that sounds kind of selfish, right? But as someone who, like you guys, has read a ton of books about labor history and about labor organizing, just labor, 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 I've got a giant bookshelf behind me. I've read a lot of books, and some of them have been really incredible, and some of them have left things to be desired, and they're all important in their own way. But I've never read a book that really pulls together all these different pieces and different stories and characters in a really intersectional way. Most books, especially those written by academics who have very specific fields of study, they'll focus on one group of workers, one era, one place. And thank God for them, because without that work, I wouldn't have been able to research this book. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to write something that shows that not only has every type of person been involved in the labor movement, like no matter where they come from, what their identity is, what, what their job is, that they've done really incredible things and they haven't done it alone. Like every movement for social justice or progress in this country does go back to the labor movement. People in the labor movement have been part of all those struggles too, whether we're talking about the civil rights movement or the disability rights movement or the feminist movement, the immigration rights movement, without labor, without workers, without labor activists, those movements wouldn't have been as strong. And I wanted to show how connected everything really is, I guess, in an effort to show people that you can care about more than one thing. Mm -hmm. And we're all, everything intersects in ways that make us really strong and give other people the opportunity to try and weaken us and break us apart. But if we stand together, that does mean that our chances of winning are a lot greater. Right, right. Absolutely. I think that segues perfectly with something that I wanted to bring up, which is, you know, in popular culture, it seems like when you think of unions, you think of organized labor, we're supposed to picture a big, burly white guy in a hard hat. Like that seems to be the, you know, the popular consciousness around unions. Now, you know, of course, we know that's not representative of the labor movement now or in the past uh, or just the working class more broadly. 
And I think your book does an excellent job really tackling that misconception. So could you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think that is one of the essential, you know, the essential accomplishments of your book. That was really one of my motivating factors in doing this, right? Because even growing up, my idea of what a union was and who it was for was for guys like my dad, burly white guys in hard hats. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I got to Vice and realized, oh, they do make unions for people like me? Wow, I had no idea. That was a huge shift. And I think a lot of people are kind of realizing this, especially now we have this uh, you know, greater public attention on organizing workers in different kinds of workplaces like Starbucks and Amazon are getting a ton of interest. Like any any worker can join a union or form their own union. Like we're we're all allowed. We all count. And this avatar of the, you know, the burly white guy has kind of been used to exclude a lot of people and to discriminate against a lot of people. And that has only harmed the movement and harmed workers. And honestly, if you want to get into demographics and facts and figures and all that, the most typical type of union member in this country is a black woman who works in healthcare or in the service industry. Hmm. Like the most, I think the most heavily unionized demographic in this country is black women. So why would the idea of a union member not be a black woman? And right. there's probably a lot of reasons why it has been more convenient to push other ideas of who a union is for. But in this book, I wanted to make it very clear that, yes, the white guys in hard hats, they're there. We love them. Shout out mm -hmm. to the boys. But so many other types of people have done such important work and have been here since the beginning. That's the thing. Right. It's not a new thing that, you know, black and brown workers and you know, queer and trans workers and like, you know, different types of workers that don't work in traditional automotive industries or manufacturing industries like that's not new mm -hmm. we've always been here and i wanted to make that very clear because i think that making that crystal clear is a way that we can show those people that this is their movement too and mm -hmm. that they are like they've always been part of it we've always been part of it the narrative might have left us out but that doesn't erase the accomplishments of what we've done right right and i, I think that for me, when I was when I was reading the book, something that came that that just kind of came out from the pages was that the the working class constantly has to reassert itself as such, like as a class against internal and external forces that are seeking to divide it, um, you know, along the lines of gender, race, sexuality, mm. migratory status, you know, things like that. And where workers divided, they lose more easily. Um, and where they're not divided along these lines and where we incorporate and encourage people that are part of these marginalized groups that have always been part of the labor movement, even if they've been relegated to the sidelines. When we bring them in, um, it's better for it's better for them, obviously, but it's also better for everybody else. What do you feel like, whether in, in your book or not? But what do you feel like is the best kind of um, warning may teachable moments in in labor history where working folks were divided and, and where it's it pr they pretty obviously could have done better they could have they could have won or come closer to winning had they not allowed themselves to be divided i mean there's so many ugly moments in labor history where that those divisions have been made very clear and that discrimination has just been like allowed to run rampant. Like I always think about how the American Federation of Labor, the predecessor to today's AFL-CIO, early labor organization, they were all in on this really xenophobic racist legislation like the Chinese Exclusion Act. That was back in the 1880s. And instead of seeing like a new wave of workers coming to this country, trying to get involved in the workforce as a new workforce to be organized, they saw people as coming to take their jobs, take their members' jobs. And that's a really ugly sentiment that we've seen mm -hmm. repeated throughout the centuries, whether it was black workers, whether it was immigrant Irish and Italian workers, now with Latino immigrants, like there's always this idea that some people are coming to take something that we have instead. And, you know, some labor leaders and, and parts of the movement have fallen victim to that and perpetuated that. But not everyone has bought into that. Right. And the unions who have rejected that racist, xenophobic rhetoric, like I think they're so much stronger for it, so much more effective for it. Like one of my favorite examples, it's a little bit further back. One of my favorite examples of 
just how powerful it is when workers from different backgrounds and different experiences come together uh, as an 18, no, not 18, 1946 in Hawaii, uh, the Great Sugar Strike. Mm. And I talk about it all the time because I think it's really cool. Um, I, mm-hmm. I think things are cool. Um, yeah, Jersey Dirtbag. But yeah, I think it's really cool the way that the workers were able to get around all these obstacles that the bosses put in their way. Uh, some context at that point in the Hawaiian Islands, there is there's these massive sugarcane plantations that made a ton of money for white guys who lived on the mainland while working, you know, the laborers to death. And they were predominantly worked by Native Hawaiian, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Filipino, Puerto Rican, uh, workers from kind of all over the place, predominantly Asia. And the bosses kept all these workers in different segregated camps and they paid them differently and they treated different workers, like workers from different uh, nationalities differently. And they said very explicitly, like like in their letters, we want to make sure that they don't get together and organize because Mm -hmm. that's, that's the last thing we want. And then when it came time to strike, their union, the ILWU, International Longshore and Warehouse Workers Union, who have a very cool, very radical history of their own, they realized like, okay, we need to bring everyone together. We need to make everyone see this as their cause because previously different nationalities had been pitted against one another as strike breakers, like whether it's mm-hmm. Filipino workers breaking a Japanese worker strike or you know just other permutations of that. But going into this, those organizers were like, okay, we're going to get translators from every language in every community, make sure everyone knows what's happening. Everyone feels heard. We're going to set up strike kitchens and have workers cook for one another and build a community that way. We're going to make it very clear that everyone is equal in this union. Everyone is equal in this strike and we're all fighting together. And that strategy won. And they, mm-hmm. they, they got her like a 20 year high raise. Like they did, like they conquered the sugar barons. And I think there's such an important lesson there. Like it's, it seems so simple, but honestly, just making sure that everyone can understand what's happening everyone knows everyone feels heard and everyone feels respected that's how you win like shutting people out or dismissing them because they have a different experience or speak a different language that's a recipe for failure like we've seen it before and hopefully we won't see it again but we probably will Mm -hmm. (laughs) but that's the lesson right right? be cool like treat everyone equally (laughs) i when i read that i was like oh this is so cool because i've i've read you know, you you mentioned that you know, uh, you've you've obviously read more than I have, but I, I've been able to read a few books now about labor history and 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 when I was reading that story, I was able to remember some testimony from Solidarity Stories, which was a book about oh, Harry the, Bridges' book. Yes, yeah, yeah, about that strike, and I was like, oh, this is so cool. I'm reading about it in two places by two different people. That's so awesome. Yeah. and there were um, so many other things about it that I couldn't squeeze in, like mm-hmm. IWW was involved. But please go on. Oh no, no. I mean, it was it was really cool, and and the ILWU uh, is a very cool union. I would definitely recommend reading uh, Solidarity Stories as well, um, and. You know the uh, uh, oh shoot I lost my train of thought we were talking about I don't know well but, <laughs> no yeah you go ahead that. Adam yeah I was gonna just say I think one of the coolest things about that story was you mentioned how the ILWU actually was organizing workers on the boat rides over to yes. Hawaii wasn't that something <laughs> that was like what a different that approach is the toughest thing like that was yeah for for listeners who haven't read it yet like that was. It was really a stroke of genius because um, the bosses were bringing in uh, boatloads of strike breakers from different countries, bringing them in and assuming they would screw up the strike. But the sh- the stewards and cooks and other workers on the ship were union. So they just organized all the workers in advance. And when they showed up, when all those new folks came off the ship, they were greeted by like a union band and they already had their union cards and they completely foiled the boss's plan and added a whole bunch of new members to the strike. It was like, that's the kind of, you know, innovative uh, wall to literally talk about wall to wall, (laughs) starboard to port organizing we need. Yeah. I mean, so many, I think, you you know, the, the, the idea or, or the response to a whole lot of people of people being brought in as as strike breakers, which is, uh, would just be to, you know try to not let them in or try to, you know, get them deported or, or not be able to immigrate here or, um, you know, uh, j- just that the idea of organizing the strike breakers, it just never occurred to so many people. Um, it, it is it's a cool. really I mean, cool story. 
Yeah, I mean, that's there's that's another lesson from the past we can we can learn from. You know, there's even I'm trying to remember. I don't have the specific uh, page number, or whatever, in my head. But there's another instance during the Mine Wars, I think, when um, a bunch of actually, yeah, a bunch of incarcerated folks were brought in to act as strike breakers for this conflict that was going on between coal miners and the coal bosses, and they were all kept in like a stockade to, of course, can't make sure that they, you know, have to make sure they can't be free while we're they're working for people for nothing but the miners who they showed up and they just set everyone free and they burned down the stockade so not only did the strike breakers not break the strike a whole bunch of people got free and mm-hmm. like things like that are just so cool to read about and like so inspiring to share with people because it's like labor history is really cool and exciting and fun mm-hmm. you just have to show people the fun parts and you know and i read a lot of books that are really well researched and really in depth and really really valuable but they're not a ton of fun to read right unless you're like looking for something specific i think there's a difference between research books and reading books maybe mm-hmm. i don't know i don't want to be shady to anybody everyone's work is very important who's trying to preserve working class history but i wanted to make sure my book was something you could pick up on your break mm-hmm. and not feel like you're doing homework right right well and you bring to get you bring so many story i mean it's like 320 pages and if you look at the contents i mean it's so many like 13 (laughs) chapters each chapter is a specific type of worker and in each chapter for each type of worker you tell you know two to half a dozen to seven or eight different stories about each of those different types of work so it's really Pulling together so many different things, and you know, while we're on the while we're on the topic of of, of maybe marginalized workers or, or bringing people together, you know, I think the the um, the chapter that you have about the the queer workers was very cool, or maybe it was it was in a different it was in a different. Oh, yeah, they, this is this is the thing. So I had a whole when I was going through putting together chapters, there was like certain categories of workers I wanted to make sure mm-hmm. I had their own chapter. And I kind of debated with myself, do I want to have a chapter focused on queer workers? Right. Or do I want to just feature a whole bunch of queer characters and make it clear that queer people are, people are everywhere in the movement and have been the whole time? And I feel I decided that was the best way to go. Yeah, um, yeah. Because that's true. But the, I think the chapter you're, you're talking about, the movers, chapter nine, that just happens to have a ton of queer characters. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was kind of fun, just because I think even in the intro to that chapter, I talk about how when people think about transportation, it's mostly like the Teamsters or whatever. Right. It's like, well, let's talk about flight attendants and marine cooks and stewards mm-hmm. and trans truck drivers. Like that's, I tried to kind of take these, even the most traditionally like masculine white coated ideas of like the manufacturing worker or like mm-hmm. the factory worker or the miners. Like I wanted to take those and make sure that those were like, the queerest or most feminine or whatever (laughs) chapters because like everyone else has been here too. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the Marine cooks and stewards and the flight attendants was definitely a very, uh, those were really cool. And, and, and the, the trans truck drivers, you know, that the isolation of being a truck driver, being a solace for people who are constantly, you know, bombarded by society, uh, discrimination and, you know, stuff like that. That was, that was a really interesting, interesting dynamic that I would have never never thought of because yeah. you know you think of you think of a truck driver and you think of a of, of a, a big burly teamster or something right but trans truck drivers are are apparently like a not uncommon phenomenon and it kind of makes sense and it's really I have to shout out Anne Belay who wrote a book called semi-queer that was a huge source for that chapter mm-hmm. uh, and yeah she interviewed a ton of queer and trans truck drivers and and black and female truck drivers, again, folks that disrupt that that idea of the mm-hmm. you know the white dude in a with a beer belly, mm-hmm. uh, which is also fine not to body shame anybody. There's just that right. idea, right? Right, right. But um, yeah, and that's the thing. Like, I'm not clearly I'm not the only person to put this stuff together, right? Like, tons of really brilliant authors and historians mm-hmm. have done like very focused studies on these very kind of intersectional. Um, histories of different types of worker. Anne Belay has done a, a couple books, like just looking at queer workers in specific places. Like there's that one, and there's one about um, she wrote about seal workers uh, in like Indiana. Like mm-hmm. she's done really cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And like I, I hope that my book is seen as being sort of in conversation with that work and yeah. part of this 
this history that I think it's maybe a little bit more radical, right? But like this new tradition, or not even that new, this tradition of covering working class stories in a way that's intentionally intersectional and intentionally mm-hmm. makes sure that no one's left out because a lot of people get left out like right. and have gotten left out. And I wanted to scoop up as many of them as mm-hmm. I could fit and put them in a book that people could find at like Barnes and Noble right. and read and then hopefully go through the bibliography and follow the breadcrumbs and find all the other cool stuff out there. Like, and it was re- it was really cool. Intro. Yeah, it was, it was really cool seeing the characters like that being brought out, but also other characters fighting for them on the basis of their different identities and and the you know the way that they're you know the marine cooks and stewards some of the things that they fought for was like you know freedom to be gay and like not you know not be fired and and things and, and yeah. that's and this was happening. When when were when, when were they when did they win the right to like you know be gay basically be in themselves <laughs> yeah 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 it was, I think it was like in the 30s really when that union kind of came into its own in the because previously to the 30s in yeah the before 30s, that it was like you had a, sailors you know fighting for queer rights that's crazy yeah like the the phrase they had like the slogan they had was no queen baiting no red baiting. Uh, sh- no race baiting. So mm-hmm. it was a very black, very mm-hmm. queer, very lefty union. And of course, like that, they didn't last as long as we would have wished they would have because of the red scare, because of all this mm-hmm. anti-lefty, anti-everything sentiment that we that so many people had to deal with. But the fact that they existed, it is really um, uh, Alan Bubley. Bu- there's there's a great mm-hmm. social historian that really preserved that history and interviewed some of those workers and I was able to find like these archives and whatnot but yeah like that's just such a cool story and it just shows that labor has always been radical there have mm-hmm. always been radical lefty diverse people involved in this movement like from the very beginning and it's I mean all the cool stuff that we've won all the progress we've made is thanks to them how do you feel like your the the stories that you wrote about in this book and that you read about for this book how do you think that informs your writing about struggles today i think that you are are probably the um you know you are the person people think of on a national scale for uh when when they think of people that are telling the story of the miners here in alabama Um, my boys (laughs) yeah and and you know that's something that like even though the miners are in a lot of ways very stereotypically union they have something in common with the queer characters in your book the immigrant characters in your book in that they are being ignored by so many different people um because of who they are right yeah because of so how do how does how, how does the work that you did for for this book inform how you report today yeah, it's, it's funny, too, that you mentioned the minor strike, because that was my one, uh, my fun thing I allowed myself as I was writing the book. I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to stay here in my office. I'm going to read my books. I'm going to do my phone calls. I'm not going to move, except when I go to Alabama to see the folks in Brookwood and try and write about them, because that's, I couldn't, I couldn't give up on them, because it was, it became almost a, yeah, a personal mission to make sure people were paying attention. Mm-hmm. But even, and the, the most effective thing I've found when covering that story and any other labor story too, is the is placing the utmost importance on workers' voices and on getting the story directly from the horse's mouth, if you will. Like, love unique communicators, they're wonderful, but you if you want people to care about something that's happening, you have to show them why they should care. You have to humanize the characters. You have to put a face to the problem, a face to the issue. Like, you could tell someone oh, there's a bunch of coal miners on strike in Alabama and, you know, they're having a really rough time and that person might not care very much. But if you show them a video of Greg Pilkerton talking about what he's dealt with on the picket line, about how him and his wife were injured by company goons, like, and just see the look in his eyes when he talks about finding out his wife was hurt. Like, if you have a heart or a soul, you're going to care about what's happening to that man and his coworkers. And that's just the biggest lesson I've learned through writing about labor in general is like put the workers first and do everything you can to show that people are flesh and blood characters and that every worker deserves you know sympathy and solidarity even if you don't like 
the industry they work in, if it's a complicated industry, if they have views that are not lining up with your political views, like we can talk about that stuff, but let's make sure the workers are being taken care of first. You know, it's, it's really show the importance of empathy, I think, and it's mm-hmm. sort of um, putting some of your own political positionings, your own personal opinions, and just kind of put it to the side while we're trying to fight for something that helps everyone. It, it's been interesting for sure covering this strike in particular but i mean every labor story kind of has the same parts like it's workers mm-hmm. versus the boss it's labor versus capital in some cases in a lot of the cases it's very much a good versus evil struggle wow. and you kind of have to show the the blood and guts of it and the heart of it to get people who might otherwise just click past it to to pay attention and think oh these mm-hmm. people are, are just like me or just like my aunts and uncles or just like my grandparents Oh, it sounds right. like they're having a rough time. Like maybe I should re- look into this. Maybe I should post this. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, you gotta grab them by the heartstrings, really. Yeah, you you know you mentioned that sometimes it really is like a good and evil thing, and 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 um, some people, and I don't know where they would get this idea. They've accused me of having like black and white thinking about these issues. <laughs> um, and no, <laughs> and that I'm too biased or whatever. And and you know, I, <laughs> yes, well, and I know what side you're on. I'll admit it. Yeah, <laughs> and and you know, there's something that I <laughs> there's something I think that religious folks get right in that there are some people that I think are genuinely motivated by evil and wicked wickedness and, and and I will cop up to believing that in virtually all of these stories that we talk about the bosses are especially in this case in in, in the miners case mm. I mean it it there is nothing else that explains their behavior other than wickedness and and evil yes. and and like Agreed. a desire to wield power illegitimately over others like there's just nothing else that explains it i mean even blackrock came out the other week and was talking about like yeah this is yeah. like really great for our bottom line you should uh you should <laughs> you know you should yeah, when blackrock this. is saying like yo <laughs> you guys should chill a little bit like blackrock yeah like the personification of corporate equity evil are like mm, you're being a little rough with those boys down there <laughs> <laughs> like what more of a sign do, right. does one of the the owners need to be struck by lightning right to finally get the message <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Maybe Pat Robertson would come out if that happened and say like, wow, I think God has sent a sign that it's time for this time for you. <laughs> Gosh. And it's just, they do this to such a group of folks that are so religious mm-hmm. and so like, they're just really nice people. Yeah. <laughs> like I feel so much for the, the, the miners and their wives and their families and their community. It's like, it couldn't, it couldn't be happening to a nicer group of people. And like, that's the thing, like this is happening mm-hmm. everywhere in the country all the time. Maybe not a thousand workers, maybe not in a coal mine, but right. there is some, some rich, um, let's see, jerk who is trying <laughs> to, cr- uh, yeah, I'm like, I'm on the radio. I got to behave. Yeah, yeah. Got to keep my Jersey mouth in check. I'm in the South right now, but there's, there's some rich jerk who has all the money he and his descendants and anyone he's ever mm-hmm. looked at in his life could ever need but still wants to have that power and control right. over people yeah. that he sees as less than. And that's what it comes down to. Like people not respecting workers for the labor they do and the services they provide and the value they add, like nothing would work. Nothing would exist without workers doing it. Like any person in a C-suite who thinks that they're a self-made millionaire, billionaire is just a fool. You didn't make anything. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. Out here preaching now, or prophesizing. <laughs> amen, <laughs> amen, sister, amen. I did come from a very charismatic religious background, so um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Adam, did you have any other questions, or, or did sure. you want to? Yeah, I guess my parting questions would be: Why should the average Alabamian read this book? And what do you hope they'll take away from it? Mm, there's a lot of cool Alabama history in it, actually. That's one thing that I, I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's divine providence keeping an eye on me. But as I was doing my research, Alabama kept popping up in so many different places and different centuries of just workers 
taking power back, organizing, unionizing, striking. It's uh, maybe someday I'll write a book all about it. Or maybe one of you guys should write it. In fairness, I'm a carpetbagger. But <laughs> <laughs> I think honestly, anybody who cares about working people and about families and about the rights we have and just the history of this country, the history of poor and working folks in this country, like, this book is full of folks like that. It's full of people just like you and your family, whether you're a, a very Christian conservative Republican or a big old lefty, like someone just like you has fought for the people they know and the people they work with and made the world a little bit better. And I hope that people will pick this up and feel inspired and feel empowered and see themselves as part of that long and bloody and complicated and beautiful history and feel proud of themselves. Because, you know, we're, I think the most noble thing you can do is leave the world a little bit better than how it was when you showed up. And this book shows a whole lot of people who did that and offers a little bit of advice on how to do that. Yeah. The book is Fight Like Hell, The Untold History of American Labor. The author is Kim Kelly. It is available anywhere you buy your books, as well as you can buy it online at Red Emma's, which is a worker-owned uh, coffee shop and bookstore in Baltimore, Maryland, and at Powell's Books, which is an ILWU unionized bookstore. And if you shop through the union's link, a portion of the uh, purchase will go towards their strike fund. Kim, thanks for, talk uh, thanks for talking to us. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. I'll thanks see you all soon. All right. You just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project. And you can do that on our website, tvlr.fm.